Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers DFS Podcast with your hosts, Kyle Borgannoni and Matthew Betts. Hello, once again. We're in September. Football time is here. Betts, I need to get a let's go from you. Let's go, baby. Less than one week from football by the time this is in your podcast app. Man, I'm super excited. Uh, we're talking the island game strategy, talking Thursday night football on this show for next week. Week one's here, man. It's time to get going. It's time to get in that DFS pass for this season. Yeah, I think now we can officially turn the page to say this is DFS season. And I, I think I'm going to start keeping a running uh, just meter or a counter of the let's go and just what's where bets is at. Because when you see his excitement, it's usually on our on our little video. It's him pumping his fists. Um, it's him ready. And so, yeah, this guy's ready for DFS. I'm ready for it. And yeah, we got a great show. We're going to talk about how do you approach showdowns or a lot of people call them island games. We're going to preview the Thursday night football game. So the first football game of the year where real football is going to be played on a real field. And then maybe open it up to you guys because we're going to start a few contests between Borg and Betts and any DFS listeners. So I'm excited about our content. I'm excited next week will be our first week where we're going to record a week one and we're going to get in the rhythm of talking about the main slate and some of our favorite picks and what we're writing about in the DFS pass. So got some awesome stuff. Let's do a quick question though. Speaking of tournaments, speaking of week one, Give us a player that you are going to be underweight on in tournaments. And I use the word underweight, meaning maybe you're like, I'll sprinkle this guy in, um, or maybe it's a full fade in cash games, but give me one for DraftKings uh, and I'll give you one and then we'll go over to FanDuel. So who's someone you're going to be underweight on in tournaments? Yeah, for me, looking at DraftKings, there's two players that I actually like quite a bit for week one. We talked about the matchup, uh, I think it was two shows ago, about your Falcons and the Seahawks and how we want to go after that game. But when you look at the two players in terms of the pass catchers, they're the the primary targets for Seattle with Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. Lockett is $6,500 on DK. Uh, DK Metcalf, there's too many DKs in this. <laughs> DK Metcalf is $5,800. And so a lot of people are going to look at those two and they're going to say, I want one of those guys. By default, I'm going to take the cheaper guy. So I will probably fade DK in, in tournaments. I'll have a little bit of him here and there. And, and certainly I want some exposure to that game. So I'm going to be more in on Lockett, given that he's a little more expensive. People are probably not going to want to play him as much as DK. Uh, but like I said, both are great options. I'll just be a little underweight on DK Metcalf compared to Tyler Lockett. A, a duo that I feel like goes together is Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. And I feel like usually if you're going to play these wide receivers, you just pick one that week and maybe you get it right. I'm probably going to fade both of them this this upcoming. In DraftKings, uh, Godwin's 7,100 and Evans is 6,900. I just think with wide receivers, there's so much volatility. There's so much that changes week to week. And I'm not really high on the Bucks. They play the Saints week one, which a lot of people will look at that matchup and say that's going to go over. Um, there's just so much that changes with this Bucks team. I mean, it's, it's a new team. It's a brand new team. We just got news just literally right before this that Leonard Fournette is expected to sign with the Buccaneers. So hopefully that's still true when you guys get to hear this. But yeah, it's just... I probably will be underweight. I might sprinkle in Godwin a little bit, but I just don't know what to think. And I've been mostly off of Brady and the rest of the Buccaneers for most of the offseason. So I'll stay away there. What about on FanDuel? Yeah, this is tough to say because I love Deshaun Jackson in week one. But you know what? So does everyone else. Deshaun Jackson is the perfect tournament play, which means his ownership percentage or roster percentage is going to be through the roof in week one. Obviously, there's Alshon Jeffrey's injury. He's going to be out. Um, Jalen Reger is likely to miss time with the shoulder injury. He's going to be out. Deshaun Jackson last year, week one against uh, the Washington football team came out and balled out in week one. They're playing them again. He has that revenge narrative. People are going to see the price tag and it's really enticing uh, at I think it's just $5,700 on FanDuel is like in a range where it's cheap for for wide receivers there. So he's going to be so heavily rostered that I do actually want him a little bit in cash, which kind of sounds weird for 
you know, Deshaun Jackson, he's not really like a cash game type of player, but uh, in tournaments, he's going to be very heavily rostered. And so I'll have him. But if I'm playing like a, a bigger tournament, I'm going to try probably try to fade him a little bit just because I'm going to try to be different than a lot of the field. Yeah, I think on FanDuel, I will definitely be that way at 5,700. On DK, he's 4,900. So um, there's a big discrepancy there in price. So I, I do like him in tournaments on DK, but he will be popular. You know, people will try to think that they're being sneaky, uh, getting somebody who mostly has been forgot about during the offseason redraft. You know, Deshaun Jackson's a 10th, 12th, you know, round pick. But yeah, in FanDuel, it's, it's very different. And I think that's an important point is that across sites, Pricing will actually dictate whether you play certain players. I'm going to go with someone who's the RB5 right now on FanDuel and pricing. And that's Aaron Jones. 7,800 is a little too rich for me. Uh, there's other running backs that are around that price tag as well. Um, if, if Miles Sanders is good to go, I still like him at 6,800. There's some much more cheaper options. I love Raheem Mostert at 6,200. We've talked about Jonathan Taylor. If he gets the workload at 5,400 on FanDuel, uh, that's great. And then uh, just right below Aaron Jones, if you want to uh, pivot, Austin Eckler is 7,700. So I'm just not big on Jones. They play at Minnesota. And although that defense is kind of revamped, I'm just not convinced that Aaron Jones is a top five play this next week. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm with you on that. Or I, I am with you. I'm not sure I'm with the pricing. You better be. <laughs> not, you better not ever disagree with me, Kyle, I swear. Uh, no, I'm not sure I'm with that price. Like RB5 on that on that slate is pricey for sure. And the Minnesota defense, it is revamped, but they did just sign a big time defensive piece there on, on the line. So their front seven might be better than expected. But yeah, I, I don't know, man. RB5 pricing. I think I'm with you. Yeah, because if you didn't agree with me, I was just going to log out and this podcast was going to be over. So (laughs) I'm glad that we're on the same page. Uh, You put out an article this past week, early first look pricing, which kind of details uh, just your initial reactions uh, of doing that. Why? Just tell people real quick before we get any further in our segment, why is it so important to know those first prices when they come out? Yeah, we talked about it a little bit. I think it was on the last show. You're going to be writing a first look article every week. This is my kind of first open the book. What are the what does the pricing look like on these sites on, on DraftKings and on FanDuel? And I think it's just important to have a baseline knowledge of okay, these players are probably a little bit undervalued. These players are probably overvalued, and you know these guys kind of seem right. Um, and I took like, you know, like three or four bullet points of like my biggest takeaways from just looking at the pricing. It's on the site, thefantasyfootballers.com. It's a free article. Check it out. Um, and really what it looks at is just like the the big landscape of maybe a little bit of uh, this is what we like. This is what we're staying away from. And this is how to kind of just start the process of building your lineup. So we're going to talk a lot more about it. Your article is going to have way more detail about it. But um, yeah, check it out. I think it's uh, no bias. I think it's a great article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And regularly, you know, you're giving that out free before the season starts. Regularly, that would be in the DFS pass which just went live on the website. So right now you can go online, you can build lineups for week one. I did that for the Thursday night football game, which we'll discuss here in a little bit. But yeah, DFS pass $60 right now. And if you buy it right now, you get the combo. The UDK is free, which we've mentioned multiple times. I put out an article that you can only find in the DFS pass. It's called Millie Maker and Onesie Positions. Meaning if you're going to win a Millie Maker, what do you need to do at quarterback tight end and defense. So we've got some great stuff there. We also would love it if you guys went on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, you could subscribe and review. That would help us out a lot. And we've got some great shows that we're we're trying to unfold, not just, you know, our weekly rhythms, but we're adding in games. We've got some feedback from some of you guys that enjoyed playing the game. And you know what? Let's do it again. The drop just gets me every time, man. It's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, the control, once again, I, I love having control over these games. And if, if one week you're feeling spunky, if you want to do it, that's totally fine. But um, this is a Thursday night football edition of, uh, of this game. And really what I wanted to do is just kind of give a lay in the land. I looked at every single Thursday night football game from last year, from 2019. I excluded the Thanksgiving slate because it's not really an island game. You know, you're usually playing three games on that Thursday of Thanksgiving. So 
I looked at all of the different games uh, of what was going on. So it was 14 um, different weeks. It, it ends in week 15. But there were 14 different games. And there's a couple of major takeaways. But the first thing I want to ask you is the first four weeks last year, if there's a night football, so the first game, I don't know if you remember, was that Packers and, and Bears game. Um, three of the four teams, three of the four teams won on the road to start the year in Thursday Night Football. Who was the only home team to win their game in the first four weeks on Thursday Night Football? All right, so who was the only home team the first four weeks to win on Thursday Night Football? Was it the Bears, the Panthers, the Jaguars, or the Packers? Oh man, I'm having flashbacks of all of these games and the highlights in my head. <laughs> I know the Eagles won uh, on the road at Lambeau. There you go. Um, was it Chicago? Did they did they shock the Packers? So the Packers won that game ten to three. Oh, it was such an ugly game. It was an ugly game to start the year. Okay, so you got two left. Was it the Buccaneers? And the Panthers, did the Panthers win at home or was it the Titans and those Jaguars? Let's go with the Jaguars, man. Let's go with Minshew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it really was. The Jaguars beat the Titans, which is crazy to think about. A team that, you know, almost went to the Super Bowl. Uh, in week three, the Jaguars won at home. So, yeah, it, it was a weird start to the year. Three of the first four road teams won and then the Jaguars were the only home team. Uh, all right, let's do this next one. Last year, the average total, so over and under, you know, the average total for an NFL game in 2019 was 45.6 points, okay? What was the average total for Thursday night football games? And just to give you some context, you know, Thursday night football, especially those island games, kind of gets its, you know, the credit that people usually give it is people are rusty or they don't have enough rest. So... You know, that could mean a lot of different things. But what do you want to guess the average total was? I feel like this is a trap question. I think the totals <laughs> actually came in around something similar. I'm going to go with like 42 and a half. Not that much lower, but a little bit lower. Dude, you you hit it right on. The, it's 42.7. Let's go. You, you're a smart man. Yeah, so it was a little bit lower, um, and which kind of makes sense, you know, that there would be some low-scoring games, and some of those did pull down the average, like that, you know, Bears and Packers game that was 10-3. to 3. But, uh, but yeah, so knowing that, all right, so the average was 42.7. How many of those games, there's 14 total Thursday night football games, how many of those were scored, the total was between 40 and 48 points? So you got to think about it. that's a pretty wide gap there. Well, you gave me a freebie. You mentioned the, the week one matchup was 10 to three. So I know that one is not included. Um, I'm going to go with 10, 10 of the 14 games. What if I told you zero? Of oh, them? my gosh. <laughs> that's no, crazy, man. So. <laughs> And, and no, so this this really, you know, was eye-opening when you were looking at the games. And granted, we have a 14-game sample size, so, you know, it's almost a full season, but really it's nothing compared to the vast majority of the rest of the teams and every, every other game. But just looking at Thursday night football games, it was either last year, and this isn't predictive of this next year, it was either your team went over or your team went way under. I mean, there's games where a team scored 28 points total. 37 points, another 28, a 36, a 27, a 13, a 34. So there were some games where where teams were just hot and cold. And so we're going to talk about how do you approach these island games. And for me, one of my big points that I'll get into is you just got to pick a narrative and run with it. Because some of these teams are going to come in and just completely like lay down and roll over. And then sometimes there's going to be some back and forth affairs um, there was a really fun game at, towards the end of the year, uh, the Ravens and Jets. It was like 42, 21. Um, let's see Packers and, and your Eagles was, it was an exciting game as well. Sure was, uh, where it went 61. So you kind of have to pick which one it is. All right. I've got one more, one more for you. So you don't have in front of you the list of who played on Thursday night football, but just 
just know almost every single team was a part of that. Uh, everyone kind of gets showcased at least once. So just assume that almost every quarterback had a chance uh, to play on Thursday Night Football. My question is, which quarterback threw for the most passing yards on Thursday Night Football and which starting quarterback threw for the least amount of passing yards on Thursday Night Football? I feel like because you're smiling like that, this has to be like a gross answer, like someone you would not expect to put up yardage. I'm going to go the opposite way first. Was the least productive passer Aaron Rodgers in week one? No. Okay. No, it was not. Right. The least productive was Patrick Mahomes. Wow. Who put up <laughs> 76 passing yards with a caveat. He did get injured. Right. That was the, yeah, that was the, uh, the patellar dislocation game. I remember that. Okay. Back to Classic. the other side. Classic patellar dislocation game. Oh, classic. You see it all the time. Not really. Uh, <laughs> for this one, I'm going to go... I'm going to go with someone like a Philip Rivers. Just sounds gross. <laughs> Shout out to Jason you on that one, by the way. <laughs> it is... P. Rivers is a little gross. Um, it was actually Aaron Rodgers. Because they wow. played in another... In that Eagles game, he put up 422. Yeah, no, no surprise there. I should have known that. The birds always get torched. In every game we play. <laughs> yeah, so, guys, the reason why I bring up some of these and some of them are just a fun game for us to play is when you look at a island game, all right? An island game, it stands on us by itself. There's lots of conclusions that you can kind of draw from looking at the game. Everyone has their eyes on that matchup, and there's so many overreactions that happen. I feel like a lot of times after a Thursday night game or a Monday night game, the next week, Players are devalued if they had a bad performance or elevated if they just came off a monster performance. So it's really important when you see these games, especially this upcoming week, when we get to watch Texans and Chiefs, it's easy to make that first week kind of assumption of this is how this is. You know, if you would have done that last year with the Chiefs, you would have said Sammy Watkins is the wide receiver one for the rest of the year because he went off for them. But we need to kind of have some context around that. And so we're going to go into a couple of tips and just strategy about Island Gate, but let's kind of explain how that works on DraftKings and FanDuel. They're pretty similar. There's a little bit of a caveat difference in FanDuel, but what's it like playing a showdown lineup? How many players do you need bets in order to play? Yeah, so on DraftKings, like you said, it's a little bit different. Uh, they have six players in a showdown lineup. And then on FanDuel, it's a little bit different. We'll get to that in a second. But you got six players and you have a captain in that lineup. Yeah, and then with the captain, his points are multiplied uh, at one and a half. And so it's really important, whoever that captain is, it really needs to be the best player, you know, out there in terms of fantasy. But also the difference on DK is their salary is also multiplied by one and a half. So sometimes it's actually better to take someone that's a little bit cheaper because you can actually fit in more players. But if you're taking a quarterback, which they score the most points usually, if you're taking a quarterback, know that his salary is going to hit somewhere around like $18,000 or, you know, it's, it's a crazy amount. And so it's not always as easy as saying, I'm putting a quarterback in the captain and then I'll fill in a bunch of cheap options. You kind of have to figure out how to mix that in. And we'll talk about some of that strategy. But on FanDuel, it's a little different because your MVP is what they're called on FanDuel. Uh, they get one and a half point m multiplier, but there's no difference in their salary. So basically it takes that value idea and you're just saying, who's the best player? Who's the MVP on there? So you basically need to find the guy who scores the most amount of points. Is there a certain site that you do more for single games? Yeah, I like the salary um, strategy component to this where, like you're saying on DK, on, on DraftKings, you have to factor in, okay, if I put this player in my captain spot, Yes, he gets one and a half times the points that he normally would, but his salary is also increased, but the cap doesn't change. It doesn't go up with the showdown slate, so you still are working under a cap, and it's still difficult to fit all the players you want in. On FanDuel, it's a little bit easier because, like you said, the salary doesn't change. There's not as much salary-saving type of strategy on FanDuel, so I like that on, on DraftKings. I play on both, but I prefer DraftKings for that. For this first week, I mean, it's when the most amount of action and most amount of involvement you get from fantasy because people are just dying to see a game. I think that's what, why last year's that first Thursday night was such a letdown when you get yeah. a 10 to three contest. But the most important part really is picking a captain because that's different than how you normally play DFS and you're constructing a lineup. So why don't you tell everyone, how do you 
how do you go through picking a captain? Yeah, this, the the question really depends on like what type of um, what type of game you're playing or what type of contest, I guess is a better word. If you are playing in a cash game lineup, you know, you're trying to beat one person or you're, you're in a small field and you just have to finish in the top 50%, whatever it is, um, you cannot afford to have a bad game from your captain or you're done. I mean, there's no chance of you, of you cashing. You have to have a good game from your captain. So I'm not going to be quite as risky in those types of formats when I select a captain. Um, we talked about it. You just said, you know, quarterbacks usually score the most points. Their salary goes up um, as a result. But also at the same time, you know, if you're let's let's say, for example, like you're talking about a stud like Patrick Mahomes or Dak Prescott, and it's like a cake matchup. If it's a cash lineup, I'm fine putting him in the captain spot and kind of figuring it out from there. But if you're looking at more of like a GPP type of format, you you have to be willing to be different in your captain selection. And this kind of goes along with like the whole tournament philosophy anyway. But looking at who is is your captain makes such a difference. Like everyone's going to play the quarterback on on one team, the favorite usually. People are going to play at least one pass catcher with them. They're probably going to play the running back. But you have to be able to say, okay, what is the game narrative that I'm putting out there? You know, like Kyle said, you have to pick a narrative and run with it. Do I expect this to be a high-flying affair with lots of points? If so, great. Maybe you put in a wide receiver in, in the captain spot, or maybe you put in a tight end in the captain spot. Someone that you might think can catch a lot of passes, find the end zone, etc. You can't just always go with the quote unquote best play in your captain unless you're doing a cash lineup, in which case that does work a little bit more. But yeah, in GPPs, you got to be able to to be different and make yourself again. I, I use this phrase a lot. I feel like feel uncomfortable at kickoff because you normally wouldn't want that player to be the one you're relying on. But in these big tournaments, you got to be different. There's such a small, you know, margin for error in these kind of matchups and it swings so, so fast. If you ever, you know, looked at your app during a Thursday night football game, you see that for, for one minute, you're like, I feel like I have a good lineup that has a chance here. And then if you don't have the one player in your lineup that everyone else does, you're completely done. So there, you have to really realize that six players is different than rostering an entire lineup. And for me, the way that I learned the showdown uh, slates best is to try it out in cash. And with cash, you get to try out, especially this first week, who are some easy plays for me where I can basically, you know, play some strong floor plays. So for, for instance, playing two quarterbacks would be really easy a uh, way to start. And then you can save a lot. I, I, the crazy part is that the, the salaries are not kind of, um, they're not the same across the board. So on DraftKings, you can get a player for $200 compared to Patrick Mahomes, who's, uh, you know, over 11000 So you can have some really weird constructions, but in cash lineups, you get to play uh, a couple of positions that honestly aren't that cool <laughs> in terms of fantasy, but defenses really matter a lot in these showdowns, and they're a way to save a lot of money. I also like that I get to play kickers. I said it. <laughs> I, I knew you were going to say it. I, <laughs> It really is. It is a fun way to watch, but then you're rooting for a defense. You know, normally in a in a giant tournament on a Sunday, you're just hoping you had the one defense that got a touchdown. You're really only choosing between two defenses here. So it's it's a great way to kind of make sure that the variance is kind of closed because you're just picking between a couple. And you get to wait for more matchups on the slate for GPPs. That's what I do is I mostly play cash for these showdown slates. It's a little bit safer for me. Um, I just know that I'm if I play the GPPs, then I'm gonna miss out on one of those players. Like I'm gonna miss out on the random touchdown from Khalif Raymond. I don't know if you remember that week for the Titans, but on a Thursday night, he hit this long bomb, and I, he, I didn't have him in any of my lineups because I didn't even know who he was. So, <laughs> so it's it's important to you know try something out in cash. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely agree with that. And and really quick, kind of just speaking to that. I don't know. Did you look at the show, Doc? <laughs> I put my example was Khalif Raymond. <laughs> no, no, I didn't see In that. In the playoffs last year. So the next kind of point that I want to talk about was how do you select a sleeper in these showdown matchups? Because they're not, it's a different animal. It's so different than a normal slate where you have tons of options. And there's tons of guys that are like sub 5K on DK or sub 6K on, on FanDuel that you can feel really comfortable with. Um, but in these showdown matchups, I mean, it's literally one game. So you're going to be looking at guys that are sleepers that are like the wide receiver 
two, three, sometimes four on a roster that you would never play in a redraft league. You would never play in a cash lineup in a regular slate. Um, and so it makes it makes the sleeper selection a little more difficult. And I will say, too, you need to be monitoring these injuries way more closely and, and not necessarily that it matters more here versus on a Sunday. But you just need to be able to monitor them because if there's any change in status, the selection of player pool that you have to choose from that you feel comfortable about starting is so much lower. Uh, you have to be able to be looking at these guys to say, OK, who can who can I snag that, you know, because of this injury is going to come in and catch four balls for, I don't know, 48 yards and two touchdowns, like something just random. And, and it really narrows your player pool. And the, the the option I wanted to talk about was Khalif Raymond. So it's great that you brought it up. That's so he, funny. He was the biggest uh he was the captain on the biggest tournament winning lineup last year in that playoff game. Here's a stat line, one target, one reception, 45 yards, one touchdown. I mean, the probability of that happening <laughs> was so low, but it's a sleeper because it's different. Not a lot of people played it and everyone else in that game said, Oh, Derrick Henry is just going to go wild and run all over these guys. But the player in this tournament didn't have Derrick Henry. He had the stack. He had, Ryan Tannehill, he had Khalif Raymond in there, and he also didn't play A.J. Brown. So you have to be able to kind of look at this narrative that you're creating in your head saying, okay, maybe Derrick Henry isn't going to smash this week, even though everyone else thinks he is. If I want this player to hit this pass catcher that no one's heard of, I need him to be with Tannehill as well. And so you really kind of want to like just look at the overall picture, paint a a picture in your head, you know, tell yourself a story and run with it. And that's kind of how I go about finding sleepers. Again, it's so uncomfortable in these in these (laughs) types of showdowns because the player pool is just so small. Yeah. And if you go into your your game saying, I know exactly who this sleeper is, you're probably wrong. You just have to be able to know that there's maybe somebody out there. Uh, and we'll get into it in just a second. We're going to preview the Texans and Chiefs game. And there's a couple of sleepers that uh, I think would be good for us to kind of mention. But yeah, he was the one that stood out to me because it was the last Thursday night football game or one of the last ones. It was against, no, it was in the playoffs. That was the Saturday the night. Last? Yeah, Saturday night playoff game. It was like Gosh, rainy yeah. and cold and gross. Yeah, he put people over the top. And I, you know, I bet he was in, you know, less than 2% of lineups or whatever it was, you know, but that, that's, how, that's what you have to do. But it is great that you get to look at one matchup. You get to kind of just look at who's okay. Who's the four string wide receiver on this team. I've never thought about that before. And you get to at least say, maybe I'll throw him in a lineup. So it's really fun to kind of get on that micro level, but I want to end this segment just to talk about Island games are so much more micro and so much more random because you're looking statistically speaking, at just a one game sample size. So when you look at analysis, the way that we usually do it is kind of on the season long level for redraft leagues and dynasty, where you're saying, I like this player this year, and he's going to have the ebbs and flows, like even the best players in the league, even the best wide receivers are going to have really down weeks. But you're basically saying, this is one week, and this is what I think is going to happen. And you got to pick a narrative and you got to run with it, like we've been saying. So for this first Thursday night game, let's let's kind of talk about that. And let's pick a narrative, you know, not saying we're right, not saying this is our final opinion, because things will change. Uh, the line for Texans at Chiefs did change where it's now at 54. It was at 54 and a half earlier. And the Chiefs are now favored by nine and a half. I just checked that right before this, and it will probably change in the next week. Um, any initial takes that you're seeing from uh, just looking at the lines so far, the Vegas lines of Chiefs uh, minus nine and a half. Yeah, just real quick, kind of speaking to historically what happens for the Chiefs uh, in home openers with Andy Reid. They cover the spread um, five and two in covering the spread. They're six and one in terms of win loss. So certainly Vegas is kind of going that route and saying, OK, the Chiefs are likely to win. They've got the better coaching staff. I think we can agree on that. And I'm just laughing because I'm looking at the show doc. Uh, A peek behind the curtain. (laughs) Bill O'Brien's chin. (laughs) That's all he gets. On the show doc. That's all I see. Um, And of course, it's the the dimple on the chin. So I'm cracking up at that. But uh, if you guys want a good activity, just go Google Bill O'Brien's chin and then only (laughs) like screenshot that part and leave it on your desktop and see what people say. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, what was I saying? Oh, the the Chiefs have a better coaching staff. They're certainly favored in this matchup. And 
I think they can come out and and go wild in this game. I mean, they're returning, I think it's 18 starters in total compared to the Texans who are not. And, you know, that matters, especially in this season where continuity is just so key with these offenses and the weird offseason that it was and training camp being weird and no preseason. So I like the the Chiefs in this one. And I definitely uh, think the over has a chance to hit because if you look at what happened last year and what Deshaun Watson can do when he's trailing, certainly this could be a shootout. Yeah, this is a rematch from last year's divisional game. Remember where the Texans were obviously up a ton and then, you know, the Chiefs just came storming back and just stomped on them. Uh, It's crazy. I looked this up. Uh, When opposing teams led the Chiefs by 10 or more points last year, Mahomes was 5-0. and That's unfair. That's not real. Unreal, that You can have man. a player to come back. Uh, and then th- what I love about the Chiefs, too, is that they're willing at the beginning of the game to just say, we're going to throw the ball. That's what we're going to do. So no team in the NFL, this is per uh, sharp football, uh, pass the ball as often as the Chief in the first three quarters of the game. So 67% of the time, they were throwing the ball at the beginning of the game. They're just saying, this is who we are. This is what we're going to do. And maybe towards the end of the game, when they were destroying people, um, they would run the ball more. But yeah, I, I like them being able to push it. Nine and a half is creeping up there, um, but it's the home opener. They're the Super Bowl champs. And um, if you remember, the Chiefs a couple years ago came out on Thursday Night Football and they beat the Patriots. Um, I remember that game and Tyreek was going all over. Play. That was the Kareem Hunt game where oh, yeah. he was just going bananas but yeah chiefs nine and a half um i don't mind it but it's way higher than i would i don't i don't i don't like to get that close but also the texans this is not a a fearsome texans defense by any means like are you intimidated at all Mm -mm. we haven't seen anything from them especially in the secondary that's the biggest concern and you know if you're going up against the middle of the road quarterback maybe it's not a huge concern but as you just said uh it is patrick mahomes (laughs) i am concerned if i'm a texans fan with the secondary so how are you attacking this just for the captain spot choices obviously the two quarterbacks are unbelievable they're in play on dk Mahomes is uh, a little over 12,000 12,600 and deshaun watson is 11,800 any lean you're 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 at right there yeah i mean it kind of depends too you know if you're playing cash if you're playing in a tournament um certainly you know you look at the historical data actually uh, of thursday night football uh or just showdown in general not just thursday night football but also the sunday night game the monday night game in general the favorite according to vegas the quarterback on that team has the highest hit rate so to speak of being the, the correct selection of the captain spot Obviously, it's Pat Mahomes. We don't really need to go into the analysis. It's a great play, but it's so expensive and it makes your lineup look way more difficult to get those pieces in. I tried it today. I was playing around with it a little bit. So I'll have a little bit of him in my captain spot, but I'm also fine going to Sean Watson at the captain spot, especially in cash. I like quite a bit. He is a guy who, when they are losing, just puts the team on his back. Um, His efficiency rises by a ton. He goes from 7.7 yards per attempt up to 8.4 when they're losing. And then he goes from 4.4 yards per carry to 6.3 yards per carry when they're losing. So he just says, you know what? This is my team. I got this. Um, And that just seems like fantasy gold. So if Vegas is predicting, heck, a 10-point loss potentially from from Houston, Deshaun Watson should have plenty to to work with there in the second half. Yeah, you're dealing with probably two of the quarterbacks with the highest ceilings in the NFL. I mean, other than maybe Lamar when Russ is cooking, I mean, these, these quarterbacks can just completely take over. And yeah, I love Watson. And if you're projecting them to be behind, he's a great kind of pivot off of Mahomes. They're only $800 difference. So it's really not that much, you know, to just go up to Mahomes and just stay with it. So it's kind of just picking your guy. Uh, if you're going to get both of them, you're really just going to have to, the rest of your roster is going to be trash. Um, I don't recommend doing that. Um, apart from maybe cash plays, if if you think that's where you want to go. I do like, for in terms of utility plays, I really do like the Chiefs defense. Deshaun Watson, three years in the league, has been sacked at among the highest rates ever in league history. And so if you know that you're getting sacks, you're probably going to also create turnovers. And this Chiefs defense is a lot better. If you remember two years ago, this is a defense that people picked on all the time. But last year, especially second half of the season, they were pretty formidable. In the playoffs, they got better and better and better. And 
they have a lot of continuity, which is something you need in 2020. So the Chiefs at 3,400 have been one of my main plays in terms of my utility spot. How do you feel about that? I like it if you're playing Watson, actually, which kind of sounds counterintuitive, but I think it's an important thing for our listeners to know is like, you know, everyone thinks about defense in fantasy as being like, okay, I want the team that is going to be um, shutting them down and it's going to be like a, you know, 14 to zero game or something like that where they're just dominating. But really, you need the opposing quarterback. And we're talking about Deshaun Watson potentially having to take over this game and throw more and potentially run more and create sack and interception opportunities. Therefore, defensive scoring for the other team. So it's kind of counterintuitive. You don't get docked a lot of points on these platforms if the other team scores points. So like if even if Deshaun Watson comes out and the Texans put up 21 points, they score three touchdowns. There could still be a pick six. There could still be a fumble recovery or two, a bunch of sacks. So I actually like that quite a bit. Yeah, it does sound counterintuitive, like you said, but it, he's going to keep pushing it. If they're going to be behind, if there really are, you know, nine and a half point dogs, he's going to have to keep pushing it on the road. And you want those turnovers. And you, especially if you get like a pick six or, you know, if you, if you get a quick score from the defense, um, you're actually he's on the field again. You're you're getting Watson up again and more plays run. So, yeah, I don't mind that. If you're playing Watson, Chiefs defense is a great way to do it. Uh, a couple other plays that I really like. Um, you know, if you're gonna go Watson, stack him with Will Fuller or the Flying V, as he's now called. And yes. how do you feel about David Johnson? We don't really know what to do with him. He's 7600 on DK. Duke Johnson is 4800. How do you feel about the the D Johnson Bros? Well, first of all, you have to make sure you select the correct D Johnson when you're doing this. Um, I want to kick it back to you, though, before I answer. I mean, your research over the, the past couple of years has really pointed to vacated targets going to a running back. Mr. DeHondre Hopkins is not on the roster anymore. 150 targets last year. Like, are you confident that David Johnson is going to be getting a lot of receiving work this year? It's really up to Watson because the Texans have been bottom five in terms of running back market share. Like they just haven't been thrown in the running backs. They acquired Duke Johnson. And so you figured last year, oh, he's just going to get a ton of targets because he's basically a slot receiver sometimes out of the backfield. And they still didn't hyper target it. But I do want to say not throwing to the running back is not a quarterback trait. It's a scheme. And so Watson can do it in the same way that Cam Newton never threw to the running back. And then all of a sudden he had Christian McCaffrey and he shifted to that. So he's got two great receivers who are running backs named D Johnson. Um, (laughs) And so we're out on the field. I do think that there will be an increase. Yeah. The Texans have the highest percentage of vacated targets in the league. So their floor are, is a little bit higher. Um, I still am not, I need to see it with David Johnson first um, until I, kind of want to plug him in my lineups and just say i mean i'll, I'll definitely sprinkle him in some lineups but yeah. um i'm not over the moon yeah i think i'm with you and it's tough because if this is a carlos hyde duke johnson situation and we're looking at okay maybe they're playing from behind a lot more i would probably be fading uh carlos hyde and just going after the pass catcher running back but they're both great pass catchers so you can't really take that narrative anymore i will say however you know last year the chiefs were a team that you could definitely run on and a lot of that was because Chris Jones missed time with injury quite a bit last year. And in the games he was in, the Chiefs defense was a completely different animal. When he was out, you could run on this defense with ease. And so assume he'll be ready for week one. Hopefully nothing changes in the next week or so. Um, I probably will be fading David Johnson in this matchup just because I'm not sure he's going to get the pass catching work. And for that reason, it'll be a little bit tougher to run on this defense with him in the lineup. What's important, too, is who is the high-end guy that you're going to go for? Is it going to be Tyreek Hill at a little over 10,000? Travis Kelsey is 9,200. CEH is 8,800. Of those three Chiefs, which are the highest price options, anyone that you're leaning towards, or are you just going to, in tournaments, kind of figure it out from both? Can I just say yes? I mean, <laughs> it's all these are all great options. Um, I'm looking specifically at Tyreek Hill. He is a guy who's just like his speed is just unmatched for uh, for this matchup. No one can keep up with him on that defense and that secondary. And we saw it last year, too. He came out early in the season, burnt him for two touchdowns, uh, went over 80 yards, had a great game. It was a little bit of a stinker in the in the playoff game. But, um, you know, different circumstances, obviously, at that time. I think he's the guy that if I'm going to put my money on one of these guys and pay up for him, 
Um, I'll certainly have a little Travis Kelsey and potentially some of the other guys that you mentioned. But yeah, I want some Tyree Kill in this matchup. If you really wanted to spin down, uh, McCole Hardman's just 5,200. He's the one-touch man, so he's got the potential to take it to the house. And in these kind of slates, like that changes things. I don't love Hardman uh, that much unless it, you know there's something to happen to Tyreek for main slates. But for, for showdowns, like he's so fun. He's so intriguing. He's kind of one of those slate breakers that I really like. And then on, on the Texan side, I don't mind Randall Cobb at 4,200 if he's going to get a lot of those slot you know, targets and they may not mean very much. You know, he could easily get like a five for 42 kind of game and maybe luck into a touchdown and uh, you've more than tripled X. So I, I don't mind him. What about, let's just go through a couple of salary savers and players that, you know what, I'm just going to go off the board here. I, I'm just going to go for it. So who's somebody you like that's kind of cheap? Yeah, I'm glad you brought Randall Cobb up because he's a great, I think, uh, cash game play. He's going to get a few receptions for sure. So I'm looking at him. But if we're talking about someone that's even cheaper, I mean, I'm willing to go down uh, to a guy like Darrell Williams, who you have on the show doc here, because there's been a lot of uncertainty about um, is it going to be DeAndre Washington as the backup to CEH or that complimentary type role? Or is it going to be Darrell Williams? And Darrell Williams is eighteen hundred dollars. Uh, versus De- DeAndre Washington, $4,000. So if you want to play these quarterbacks and you want to spend up for Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill, you're going to need someone like a Darrell Williams in your lineup. And if he's going to get, let's give him like 10 touches, 10 to 12 touches at the end of the game in the fourth quarter when they're presumably winning and they're just trying to you know burn some clock. He's a guy who's super interesting to me. He could fall in the end zone and, and save your day and, and be a really, I feel like, sneaky kind of contrarian play in this uh, DFS format. Yeah, I mean, the, all the news has said that Darrell Williams is the number two, although DeAndre Washington has a history with Patrick Mahomes. Adam Levitan always uses the phrase that, uh, you know, they, they went to college together. There's a shower narrative there that they know each other very well. But uh, I, I like Darrell Williams at eight. I mean, $1,800 is nothing to throw in a couple of lineups. And, you know, maybe he only gets 30% of the carries, you know, of the touches, running back touches, but that's enough for him to luck into a couple of roles. And I personally been off CH in a lot of drafts. I just, there's a lot of unknowns. And uh, so I don't mind going super cheap. And you know what? You could have the whole backfield if you wanted to, if you wanted to go CH and Daryl Williams and, and fade, you know, some of the pass catching options for the chiefs. That's another great one. I'll just throw out a couple of tight ends. Uh, that are not named Travis Kelsey. The Texans, I don't really know who it's going to be. Darren Fells is kind of the most well-known tight end for them. Uh, but they have some other options. They have Jordan Akins, who's at 3,200. Uh, they have a guy they drafted last year, Cahill Waring, who's $600. And he's more of like an athletic freak, the kind of guy that would take like a 30, 40 yard catch to the house. And, um, yeah, he's someone that I like that's super cheap, that's off the board, that honestly might not do anything. But if they're going to be trailing and uh, trying to play catch up and maybe have some extra snaps in there, I don't mind him. Jordan Thomas is their other backup tight end. $200, probably too cheap. Um, but uh, those are the kind of players you need at the back end of your lineup. Don't forget about the kickers, okay? So if you're trying out Thursday Night Football for the first time, Harrison the butt kicker. Uh, <laughs> is a great one, and I'm gonna say this right. Kaimi Fairburn will be uh, another go. option if you want to mix. In. I know my kickers. I, uh, <laughs> I, I pride myself. That's what, that's what our listeners are here for, right? The kicker analysis. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna be able to do that for the rest of the year. So if there's one moment I get to talk about kickers, <laughs> I'll make sure I give today. him a shout out in the uh, the weekly Thursday Night Football preview show or preview uh, article in the DFS Pass for you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're going to, every single week, you're going to get to kind of showcase that. It's going to be out on Wednesdays, and you're going to be able to show people, hey, here's the general picks, here's the people I like, here's who I want to fade. Um, and so Thursday night football is so fun. It's a great way to kind of get a couple of friends together and say, you know what, we're going to watch this game anyways um, and to enter in a contest. And so for this week only, we are starting a contest, a Borg and Bets contest on DraftKings, a $2 single entry. And we wanted to do a single entry just to give everyone the same shot, really simple. And we're only going to take the first 100 people. Uh, So if you're interested in DFS, if you want to play against us, uh, the top five pay out. Uh, So 
you could win a lot of cash there and only put in two bucks. Starting the following week, we'll start doing with the main slate and have some people enter into that. But we're going to keep it at 100 just because that's a really even number to think about money and how that uh, you can distribute that. But we will send out the link on Twitter if you're interested in it. Um, you can check out our Twitter or just message us and say, hey, could I get in the, the DraftKings this week? Can I get in the league? You'll have a week, uh, almost a full week from when this podcast airs to be in on that. But be really, really fun. Something we get to participate with the listeners each week and uh, be a part of it. So any last things you want to say on the Thursday night? Uh, just let the, let the listeners know where can they find that? Is that going to be from the show account or is that going to be from your account or my account? Whose account is that coming from? People need to it's know. Gonna come from, it's <laughs> it's going to come from our account. All right, there um, you go. <laughs> and so we'll have it pinned. I'll have it pinned on my account, just the, the contest link. And uh, yeah, it should be good. Dude, hit him with uh, the handle. Oh yeah, at Kyle <laughs> underscore Borg. If you're not following, if you're not following on the Twitter, you know what are you doing? Are you stuck on MySpace? You still on Vine? <laughs> well, what are, you know, we don't have any content on Vine. Dude, some of our listeners might not even know what MySpace is. That's true. Um, it would be really cool if we found out the youngest listener here is like, you know, sixteen or seventeen. I did get it, get some mail the other day um, for the footballers. There's people that listen to our show that are like 12, 13 years old. And they're asking for advice. So it's cool to see that our show is family friendly and that people can get into fantasy football even at a young age. Uh, 100%. If, if you're interested uh, in playing a little bit more best ball, the best ball mania is still going on at Underdog Fantasy. You can sign up today for Underdog and enter in a chance for a million dollars in prizes. I just finished another draft for my best ball. I'm feeling good. You've got a couple entries. How are you feeling about I've, your best ball entries? I've got more than a couple. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, every time you do a read, I'm like, you know what? I should do another one. Why not? Uh, no, I'm feeling pretty good about them. Different con- roster constructions, different strategies. It's a ton of fun, guys. Check it out. UnderdogFantasy.com is the place for best ball. Yeah. And so as we close, hope you guys had a great week. Hopefully Island Games make more sense to you. And we're looking forward to having an awesome week one next week. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Fantasy Footballers DFS Podcast. Don't forget to visit us on the web at www.thefantasyfootballers.com.